that he always obeys with reverence and awe. Each of these stars, too, is confined by measured limits and has an appointed space to range in. Why do not all the stars in heaven run like and equal courses? Who is it that is assigned to each its place and marked out for each the extent of its course? And so forth. So it's, uh, it's a nature-oriented, celebratory, it glories in the exercise of the mind. It is not doctrinal. It is not uh, pietistic. It is magical, psychedelic, expansive. And I'm not implying that they used psychedelic substances. The evidence for that is incredibly murky and hard to get at. And probably they didn't. I mean, one of the real tragedies of Western history is that Western Europe is so poor in psychoactive plants. I mean, had, had uh, Western Europe stayed in touch with the mystery religions of ancient Greece, Christianity would never have been able to force its agenda to the degree that it did. I think you can make an argument that uh, there were psychedelic mysteries in Europe probably up until the time of the fall of Eleusis. Uh, Hermeticism is only one heterodox strain among many that were in existence in Europe in the late Roman period and that then partially survived into the Dark Ages. I mean, you have uh, Neoplatonism, which is... Uh, a group of philosophers in the in the third and fourth century, who uh, Plotinus, Porphyry, Proclus, and that crowd, and they took Plato, the late Plato, and contorted that into uh, a mystical doctrine of uh, emanation. They were what are called emanationists. What this means is you start with it's either called the one or the unnameable or Brahman Atman or something like that. And then you have a series of declensions into more and more material and more and more multiplistic expressions of being. These Neoplatonists were emanationists and their theories about how the universe is constructed have become sort of the unconscious basis of all later magical speculation. Uh, it, they are the people who brought the angels into the picture so, so intensely because they were trying to create a descending hierarchy of being from the most high down to the most low. And angels, once set in place, uh, became a real problem for Christianity because they are... Um, not very easy to distinguish from the old stellar demons of the of paganism. Paganism was largely the belief that uh, the power of the stars could be drawn down to earth through a series through sympathetic magic, really, uh, by setting up resonances in a ritual situation you could draw the power of the stars down into your projects and your intentions. And uh, the late Middle Ages was a period of uh, intensely working out all the associations between uh, minerals, colors, perfumes, plants, musical uh, notes and, uh, uh, you know, styles, so that you could then bring together all these things for purposes of magical evocation. And if any of you are interested in this, the, the book to read, which will point you toward many other interesting books, is a, a wonderful book called Spiritual and Demonic Magic from Facino to Campanella. Some of you may remember Campanella, hell of a fighter. 
anyway. Hello? <laughs> And uh, in the Renaissance, you know, over a period of about three generations, uh, this became a real problem because what starts out as angel magic ends up as out-and-out -out demonic conjuration, something which I've noticed my 14-year-old son has an incredibly unhealthy interest in, uh, which I did as well at his age. I hope it's not the family curse. Uh, <laughs> coming back um, yeah so I mentioned the dating error it was Lactantius uh, who was one of the fathers of the early church one of, of the patristic writers that's that generation of theologians uh, that followed Christ who canonized the Christian religion and he placed uh, he placed Hermes Trismegistus as older than Moses, older than Pythagoras, older than Plato. And, uh, uh, and then it wasn't until uh, Marie Cassabon corrected that problem. See, we forget how the, the really transformative uh, breakthrough that was represented for Western Europe by the recovery of all of this ancient literature. It had been completely lost. Uh, and also a, a misimpression that probably needs correcting is I think most people who are not schooled in Western history think that the further back in time, the more quote unquote superstitious people were. This isn't actually the case. It isn't a case of the further back in time you go, the more belief in demons, magical conjuration, and stuff like that you get. Uh, the uh, 10th, 11th, and 12th centuries in Europe were periods of remarkable piety and intellectual cohesion. Of course, it was also some kind of a fascist nightmare. That's how they achieved it. They had stamped out paganism. They had pushed heresy and heterodox thinking to the very distant frontiers of the empire, uh, of the, you know, the Holy Roman Empire. And uh, uh, people were not superstitious, and people were not obsessed with horoscopes and conjuration and this sort of thing. Where that all began was... Uh, well, or where it reached its culmination is in the 16th century. The 16th century, the 1500s, it was the most magical, obsessed century in the last 10. And alchemy and uh, conjuration and talismanic magic and uh, sympathetic magic, all of these things flourished really uh, not as a um, throwback, but as a kind of prelude to modern science. Modern science is an incredibly demonic enterprise. And we will see, as we discuss this stuff, that in an in curious and little, rarely discussed way, the program, uh, the agenda of, of magical dissidents in Europe have been entirely achieved by the forces of what we call modernity. It's simply that it has been done in an entirely secular metaphor. I mean, if you take even the, the trivial belief about alchemists, that they were concerned with changing lead into gold, of course, that isn't what it was about, but there were plenty of con artists running around on the periphery of these deeper scenes who were claiming they could change lead into gold. In the 20th century, we routinely change lead to gold. You do it with neutron bombardment in particle accelerators. And of course, it costs far more to do it than the worth of the gold that you get out. But that really wasn't the point, was it? It was to prove that it could be done. 
uh, the dreams of creating the homunculus uh, are dreams that dovetail directly into the aspirations of modern biology, genetics, so forth and so on. Uh, the, the great chain of being of Aristotle is animated, given a dimension of motion, and lo and behold, it becomes the Darwin-Wallace theory of evolution. Uh, the, uh, Mersiliad talks about this, about how all the alchemical dreams of the 15th and 16th century have been brought to fruition in the 20th century. But again, in the absence of magical rhetoric, but certainly in a spirit of magical and Faustian recklessness, for sure, I mean, this is scientists, you know, they claim such a devotion to truth that decency must never stand in the way because they serve a higher God than human values. They serve uh, the golem of the truth in some weird way that makes the truth okay even if it kills you. I studied philosophy from Paul Feyerabend, and then he used to say at the beginning of his Epistemology 101 course, I will teach you to recognize the truth, and I will teach you to ask the question, what's so great about it? You know, I mean, so now you've got the truth, so what's so great about it? Uh, it was 1460 when these manuscripts were brought to Florence. Those of you with photographic memories can see the time wave signature as it turns over and heads through the floor. Uh, and uh, the um, Cosimo de' Medici immediately ordered Ficino to abandon his work on, Pletho, on uh, Plato, and, uh, and the Pymander, which was one of these uh, uh, books, which had been, it was the only one which existed in Europe, uh, even in partial form during the Dark Ages. Uh, uh, Cosimo died in, in 1464, but the translation project uh, went forward, and uh, just so you understand, the, the tree, the developmental process in Western magic goes basically, all goes back to this Florentine translation project, and from there, people who were well-placed got a hold of this stuff. The most important person probably being uh, uh, a person, certainly an unsung hero in the development of Western thought, Trithemius, Bishop of Sponheim. And Trithemius uh, wrote a book. It was really a manuscript. It was never printed as a book in his lifetime, but later, called the Stenographica. And in it, he put forth many of these magical doctrines and also encryption methods for code making and breaking so that this stuff could be circulated under the eyes of the clergy without uh, causing a problem. And then the, the development of Western magic splits into two strains. Uh, the Bruno strain, Giordano Bruno, I understand he's running for president of the United States this year. <laughs> Giordano Bruno and his school, he was a Franciscan monk who ended up being burned at the stake. His sin for which he was burned at the stake was he was sitting on a rooftop of one of these Italian city-states one evening, presumably smoking some pretty decent boo that they'd brought in from North Africa, and uh, he was looking at the stars, and he, it occurred to him, these things are suns. These little points of light are like the sun. Jesus Christ! And in a single moment, the universe became infinite. And he said, if these are suns, and he just, you know, his mind was boggled, literally. I mean, can you imagine inside the medieval worldview where they have these concentric shells of angels and demons and the, all this? Suddenly, this guy gets it. 
in a single moment and he sees that the universe is infinite and he begins to say so. And this is against Aristotle. And uh, the church just goes nuts and they drive him out of Italy and he has a whole bunch of adventures in England and other places. Eventually he makes the mistake of coming back to a place in northern Italy where he's betrayed by his patron and he is, uh, he's burned at the stake for a point of view which all of us take quite for granted. The other uh, strain of magic coming down from Trithemius is the D strain. And it is a bit more accessible to people like ourselves because John D was an Englishman and he wrote in English and so you don't have to conquer uh, 16th century Italian or, uh, or late Latin in order to read him, although he wrote a lot in Latin as well. D is a very interesting character worth spending some time on because D is the last person to be able to unify into one worldview uh, science and mathematics and magic and astrology uh, all together. So he is the greatest magician of his age and the greatest scientist of his age. He designed the navigation instruments that Sir Francis Drake used to go around uh, the, uh, the Cape Horn and sail up the coast of California. He, did, he was a, an intelligence operative serving Queen Elizabeth uh, on the European continent. He could cast the best horoscope in Europe and that was his entree into these various royal families of these various capital cities of Europe. And then he was, you know, making maps of, of battlements and of the deployment of war facilities and shipbuilding capacity and stuff like that and sending it all back to Elizabeth uh, in these codes that he had learned from Trithemius, not personally, but from the Stenographica. And D, uh, a very strange incident happened, which was uh, on a cold day in April at his house in Mortlake, which is on the outskirts of London. Now it's completely surrounded by modern London. Uh, I should say, he had, he had the largest library in England. He had 6,000 books. Sir Philip Sidney and the Queen would occasionally call upon him to shoot the bull. And uh, he, he was a very learned man. So one day in April of 1582, he's working at his desk at his room in Mortlake, and he goes outside. He's, there's some disturbance in the garden, and he goes outside. And his story, and we have only his story, is that an angel descended in a ball of light and gave him an object which is uh, to this day on exhibit in the British Museum. Uh, if you ever have a chance, it's worth hunting it down. It's in the Renaissance Hall. And it's, uh, it's a piece of black polished obsidian, uh, roughly about this big and about that thick and very highly polished. It, he called it the show stone, S-H-E-W. And it, what the deal was, was you could look into the show stone if you had the right talent, and you, it was a magical theater. There were gods and demons and uh, female spirits and all kinds of things swirling around this thing. Well, for the next uh, many years, the showstone was the major guiding force on Dee's life. And a guy came to him named Edward Kelly. And Edward Kelly, uh, legend has it that he had no ears, which in England at that time meant that you had committed some 
infraction in the province and they had removed your ears. It was the mark of a con artist. Uh, was so you couldn't fool anybody else. They took your ears off. So then if you met somebody with no ears and a big scheme, you knew to keep your wallet in your pocket. So, so this guy Kelly had an immense facility with this showstone. I mean, he could just sit down with it. And it is one of the most puzzling and undiscussed episodes in the evolution of Western thought. The straight people just say, whoa, this is a bunch of crap. You know, this guy, Kelly, first of all, D was married to a much younger woman named Anne D. And at one point in the 10 years or so that D and Kelly were together, the angels of the showstone uh, gave very explicit instructions that D should allow Kelly to uh, bear of God's will, it was done, he says uh, <laughs> in his diary. So this guy was a sharpie for sure. <clears throat> However, it's, it, it's very puzzling because if he, was, if he was a con artist, he must have been a con artist of immense uh, cleverness because often the way the D-angels would work is they would deliver very, very long messages in Latin backwards. And Kelly, Kelly would just dictate this stuff at a very rapid speed, and Dee would write it down, and then they would put away the showstone, and then they would very laboriously rewrite this stuff from back to front, and then there would be these long, coherent harangues about what they should be doing, about which courtly figures they should uh, support with money and who should be introduced to who. It was very political, you know? Well, what kind of a polymathic talent was Edward Kelly that he could invert whole pages of Latin and reel it off and then have it be reconstructed and make sense. Also, there are, you see this, we know about this because Dee kept a diary over the years that this was all going on. It's one of the most astonishing books in all of English literature. And until the last 10 years, the 1658 edition was the only edition ever published. Uh, it's called A True and Faithful Relation, or in full, A True and Faithful Relation of what passed for many years between Dr. D and some spirits, with annotation by Marie Casabon, the guy who did the correct dating on the Hermetica. Uh, and it, it's very interesting reading. It's, a, as I say, one of the most puzzling instant, uh, incidents in the whole history of science. What Dee was doing was eventually he came to rest at the court of Rudolf II, Rudolf I of, of Bohemia, who ruled from Prague. Now, you have to understand, is that a hand up? Yeah. yeah. Not strong enough to to uh, warrant any getting thrilled about it. Uh, the great awareness of drug use came slightly later, uh, and strangely enough, uh, the drug was opium. Uh, it's an it's, it's interesting the history of opium. You know, we think of of uh, opium and its derivatives, uh, junk and heroin, as just the lowest, well, maybe crack is now the lowest of the low, but anyway, it's a real scuzzball drug according to most people's opinion. But did you know that no, they had been using opium for 3,000 years before anybody noticed that it was an addicting drug? It was not ever noted that opium was addicting until 1611 when John Playfair a very famous English physician wrote a book in which he commented on opium and said, uh, 
once one has begun the habit of opium, it must be maintained unto death. Uh, so, uh, in the in the thirty years after D, there was a great hermeticist and alchemical thinker named Paracelsus, who arose on the European continent. Paracelsus is an interesting guy. He's essentially the inventor of drugs because he was the first person to extract herbs and to get this notion of the essence that there's that if you have a medicinal plant then there's something in there which you want to get out and concentrate he called his school of of uh, alchemy iatrochemistry the doctor's chemistry and he invented pills of the ordinary sort and uh, and uh, he said i have made a great discovery the center of my alchemical opus rests with the magic of laudanum which was of course gum opium uh, there there was a craze in the late 15th century among alchemists for opium the the alchemist von helmuth uh, he he signed some of his alchemical tracts dr opiatus he, he was uh, the first croaker <laughs> <laughs> Did it, you say?